right, so once again, good morning. And uh, we had finished last time uh, by talking about the vorticity theorems. And we uh, uh, mentioned the boundary conditions which the ideal fluid flow satisfies on the boundary of a rigid walls of the container containing liquid or the uh, body which is immersed or moving within the within the liquid today we will be following this uh, subject and eventually we will uh, discuss a few important applications of uh, uh, those uh, equations of motion for the uh, ideal liquid and um, we shall see whether we can uh, we can uh, do this uh, so let me share the screen so we are uh, going to talk tonight about the potential flow of a uh, ideal uh, fluid and as we can derive from these variation principles we introduce if the flow is potential, then the Euler equation uh, assumes a very simple form, namely the time derivative of a velocity potential plus a velocity square plus this function, thermodynamic function W, which we might call the chemical potential of enthalpy, plus a potential of external forces are equal uh, to zero. And um, I shall for a considerable part of what will follow consider a fluids which are incompressible now uh, the definition of incompressible fluid is that the convective time derivative of a density stays equal to zero that the density doesn't change with the flow of the liquid so if you recall the definition of a convection time derivative you easily will find out that the assumption that the density is constant means that the divergence of the velocity field is equal to zero. So we know that the velocity is a gradient of a velocity potential, and we know that the div divergence of the velocity is equal to zero. So that means that the velocity potential satisfy a uh, second order differential equation which comes out from the second derivative divergence is a derivative of a velocity is derivative of phi so that's the formula and that symbol delta square is occasionally uh, written also as an inverted triangle or a delta function and that equation that the is called uh, Laplace equation. The second derivative of the potential in a three-dimensional space is equal to zero. Well, uh, the next slide will be slightly horrific, but I had to show it for you. Namely, this is how the Laplacian that is this operator of the second order derivatives looks like looks in different coordinate system. So if we employ a Cartesian coordinate, x, y, z in the three dimension space, then the Laplacian written here for a function, which I just denoted as a f, is relatively simple. It's a combination of a uh, second order derivative with respect to the Cartesian coordinates. And uh, in many, many calculations, uh, in the, uh, that form is sufficient. However, or unfortunately, in most of the important applications, we need to solve the hydrodynamic equation, and that in our case boils down to solving a Laplace equation in the other coordinate system. And if we deal with a spherically symmetric body, then very often the 
best choice of the uh, coordinate system is a spherical coordinate system. And then we have to calculate the change variables from x, y, z into this spherical coordinates, which are conveniently, conventionally denoted as a radius, the linear distance, and two angles, theta and phi. And then the uh, Laplacian operator looks like this rather unpleasantly looking complicated expression. Well, uh, you, you, you shouldn't worry too much that it looks awful because the mathematicians uh, provided for us a certain uh, way of handling this operator. Namely, you can easily see that there is a separate part of that operator which depends only on the distance, r, and uh, there is uh, the other part which depends on the angles. So there are, there are tricks to handle Laplace equation in the spherical coordinates by introduction, what is in the mathematics called the special functions, uh, solutions for the, that part of the Laplacian, that one which contains the angles is called, we may call it a, spherical part of the Laplacian or spherical coordinates part of the Laplacian. And there are some functions which are eigenfunctions of that particular operator. And uh, that uh, those functions are, have been studied by mathematicians. They are having a certain properties. So if one wants to solve the, any problem with, related to the Laplace equation in spherical coordinates, that is much easier if one learns those special functions. We don't have a time to study special functions that used to be uh, one of the most beautiful uh, uh, subjects of mathematics. There is a kind of a canonical function, uh, a good canonical book about the one particular kind of the uh, special functions which are related rather to the cylindrical coordinates and the cylindrical coordinates form of a Laplacian is this green equation on the bottom of a screen and uh, the special functions related to the cylindrical symmetry are called the Bessel functions and there is, as I said, a canonical book about the Bessel functions written by a great mathematician, Watson, British mathematician Watson at the beginning of the 20th century. This is a very thick volume which sits somewhere in my library. And uh, remarkable is that the first chapter of that uh, book is called the Bessel function until the 1863. So I was always joking that if that function will be translated into Polish language, which it has never happened, then this first chapter should be called a Bessel functions before a January uprising for this roughly that the year is a year of a, one of the uprisings against the division of Poland in the 19th century, which was uh, rather consequential uh, for our history. So this is the Laplacian in the cylindrical coordinates, which is relatively easy because it still has the normal second derivative with respect to the z direction, which is along the cylindrical axis. And then there is a radial and angle uh, radi radius in a plane perpendicular to C component and the angle theta. So that is, uh, I, I wrote this, this formula, which are now in every text, in every little booklets about the mathematical formula, or it's in a computer. You know, if you want to use this, you can click up a Wikipedia and it will tell you this form, but it's uh, 
we might occasionally look it up on some of the, of the solutions in some coordinate system other than Cartesian, then if that happened, I will use these expressions. So this is the reason why they are included here. All right. So uh, let, uh, let's see what are the consequences of the fact that we are really having to solve the, the uh, Laplace equation. And this uh, view graph is just informational. We will not get involved in this part of the hydrodynamics for it requires uh, 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 a part of mathematics, which is, uh, uh, I, I'm not sure whether you have been in your courses ever told uh, a part of mathematics, which is called the theory of analytic functions. This is why that has come out in our problem is very simple. We have to solve the incompressibility equation, which is that the divergence of a velocity field is equal to zero. So it is convenient to use a representation of the velocity such that it, this equation is satisfied automatically. And that can be done by introducing a function, which in contrast to the velocity potential, I denoted by a letter psi, which is called the stream function. And if we introduce a function psi such that the x component of the velocity field in two dimensions is equal to the derivative of a psi with respect to y, and the y velocity component of a velocity is equal minus derivative of a function psi with respect to x, then the divergence equation is satisfied automatically. Why it is done in two dimensions? Well, it turns out that in the many real world applications of hydrodynamics, a two dimension problems pop out in all sorts of unusual uh, places. So the two-dimension hydrodynamics is of great importance. Now the word of explanation, what is meant by two-dimension hydrodynamics. It is not that hydrodynamics in a really two-dimensional space. The real two-dimension space is easily manufactured in a physics. For example, if you will take the, the, in, the, the experimental physicists can easily manufacture two-dimension layers of matter, which in some circumstances do behave like a liquid. Uh, they also can manufacture two-dimensional layers of a charge fluid. So the chapter of the hydrodynamics, which we will eventually discuss, magnetohydrodynamics, is uh, also existing in a two-dimension. But uh, if this is the case that we have to study two-dimensional hydrodynamics, then introduction of the stream function psi is of the importance. So we have a two-dimension liquid. That means that the liquid properties change in two directions of the, in the plane, which is perpendicular to some axis, which we then call the z-axis and nothing is changing along that third dimension. Every changes of the fluid property happens in the two dimension direction. And that is of course a dramatic difference because if the world was really two dimension, then the hydrodynamic equations will not exist. This has been discovered uh, 
in the second half of the 19th century, rather in the 70s, that all over the Southern, uh, people find out that if we will be really living in two dimension space and we try to derive the hydrodynamic equations from a statistical mechanics in the way we discuss it at the beginning of our lectures, that is, if we write the Hamilton or Newton equations for a particles which are all living in the two dimensional world and the motion is governed by the Newton equations in two dimensions. And when then we follow all those procedures we discuss by writing a Louisville equation and deriving a hierarchy of equations or deriving a kinetic equation describing that matter, then it turns out that we will be not able to close that hierarchy in a systematic way. And that fact was, and this is something pretty remarkable, and perhaps you will be amused to hear it, that this is a consequence of the fact that the hydrodynamic equation, which we we are discussing contains the equations of motion, uh, uh, had contained the this function w. They contain the equation of state, the relation between the pressure and the density. And that is only true for the ideal fluid, but the real fluids, as we will see uh, probably already next week, is also described by the other important parameters, for example, viscosity coefficient, or a diffusion constant, or a heat diffusion coefficient. For in the liquids, there is a dissipation processes which are of a great importance. And so far, we didn't talk about them. And the in the 1954, two American young physicists who were almost the first to use at that time computers to simulate the properties of a real matter. They attempted to simulate the properties of a real matter. And because the computers were very crude, as compared to what we have now, they only were able to study first a two-dimensional system. And they look up at the properties of a two-dimensional liquid consisting of a, not hard spheres, but hard disks, because a hard sphere in two dimensions, these are hard disks which move in two dimensions and collide. And assuming a hard body collision between those disks, like in, the, in this children game, which is so popular on a Polish uh, tourist, in the, in the tourist places, uh, on a, everywhere in Poland, the, there is a game, there is an air table on which the kids can push a little, little disks and try to win the game by hitting those hard disks, then they simulate many of those disks uh, on the, in the two dimension, and they find out that there are unusual properties which comes out through this numerical simulation, which have not been predicted by any existing at the time theory. Namely, it turns out that the correlations between the velocities of those colliding disks uh, depend on time in an unexpected way. Usually it was assumed that all the correlation function between the velocities or momenta of those colliding disks uh, were, should decay exponentially in time and then all the integrals of those functions 
were finite, and the liquid coefficients, like a density, like a, like a viscosity, or a or a diffusion coefficient, or the heat transport coefficients, are given in terms of those integrals. So everything was fine, but the Bernie Older and Bin Wright uh, computer simulation in, a, as I said, 54, uh, they have shown that those correlation functions in two dimensions do not decay exponentially, but they decay as a power law. They decay as a time to a certain algebraic coefficient. And that means that, the, that those integrals are divergent, so there are no hydrodynamic equations for a two-dimensional dynamical system. <clears throat> and this was the theoretical prediction obtained by numerical simulation. And it took almost 50 years before experimental physicists were able to show that this is truly the case by a real experiment. And in the, and therefore, this algebraic decay of the certain correlation functions, which in the language used in statistical physics are called long time tails, these long time tails exist, is essentially the only physical phenomenon ever predicted by a computer simulation. And that has been done in the 50s, when the computers, as I said, were extremely crude as compared to what we have today. Actually, those simulations were important for construction of uh, nuclear reactors. So in a certain sense, we owe this discovery to the building up uh, nuclear reactors in the 50s. And if uh, a certain people who claim that we should abandon nuclear energy will eventually win, then we will never have a nuclear reactors and there will be no point of studying this problem, what happens with the diffusion of a hard disk. So that was a side comment on a two-dimensional world. And if we, coming back to hydrodynamics, if we write the velocity in terms of a stream function, then the divergence the, uh, the, is, is satisfied automatically. And we, uh, we are now having uh, two functions a potential function phi, which is related to the velocities by that equation, and is also the function psi, which is divided by those two equations. So it is convenient to combine those two functions in a certain complex function, which unfortunately is again denoted by letter W, but this is not the same W as in the Bernoulli equation or in the equation, Euler equation for compressor. This is just the notation. It's a complex value function of the function psi and phi. And we also write that function as a function of a complex variable, which is x ply y i. And that is analytic function of a complex variable z. And um, uh, the, uh, this function obey a very simple equation. This equation is w, is derivative of w with respect to z. And that is what is called the complex velocity function. And it has a form of a, a, a any complex number can be written as a, as its, its modulus and the phase, and the modulus of that function w, of that complex velocity, derivative of w with respect to s, the amplitude of that function is a value of a two-dimensional velocity, real physical velocity, 
and it has a certain function psi, which is related to the vorticity. So uh, that was a technique which was invented in the 19th century because with the use of a theory of analytic functions uh, and the properties of those functions, it was possible to solve many equations without necessarily invoking a numerical procedure, which at that time were essentially non-existing. They, they were very cumbersome. So I just mentioned that because they, uh, you might occasionally bump in, in reading some uh, uh, papers, you may bump on the in hydrodynamics if you will ever need to use a hydrodynamic to solve your problem, you might be encountered with this uh, uh, idea of using the complex function and uh, at least you will know where to look up for, uh, for, the, for more information about it. All right. So I will now uh, uh, concentrate on um, on uh, using this simplified, this Laplace equation, which is the consequence of the Euler and continuity equation uh, for studying a potential flow of a fluid in three dimension. And then uh, uh, I apply that for a particular application, namely the motion of a body in a fluid. That is of a tremendous importance for in the all sorts of applications from how the ships move on the sea or how the blood cells uh, move in our blood or what happens with the uh, with the dynamics of a suspension uh, in the in the liquid why it so happened that if you will uh, uh, if you will uh, take uh, something which is <laughs> hardly available nowadays because of the we are producing too clean milk but if you had ever seen a, a buttermilk, uh, a, a, a cow milk, which, is, which gets sour by just standing uh, for a day or two without outside of the refrigerator, then you will see that it separates and that the, there is a layer of a slightly yellowish liquid on top of it and a more dense white stuff on the bottom, then motion of this fat particles suspended in the milk is also governed, is also the problem of a body moving in a fluid. And the, uh, that all is boils down more or less to solution of the Laplace equation. So we will be studying that from now on. We remember that the velocity is a gradient of phi, and it satisfied the Laplace equation. So here we have a picture of what we will be studying. We have a body, which is a red circle, which moves in a liquid. This is the infinite volume of a liquid, which is denoted by this blue box, but well, you think about it as an infinite reservoir of a liquid. And uh, the and there is a mathematical construction which we will need in the calculation. This is artificially drawn a sphere with a huge radius r which surrounds the moving body. And I shall call that this mathematical construction, uh, mathematically construction sphere as uh, s, yellowish s. So uh, we have a Laplace equation. And uh, we are looking at the solution of the Laplace equation in a three-dimensional world. Uh, because 
the fluid is, as I said, infinite, then we are studying only those, and the motion of our sphere is local. There is a little object which moves locally, so it is natural to assume that far, far away from that red body, the velocity and also the velocity potential decay to zero. So we are looking at the solution of a Laplace equation, which vanishes sufficiently fast at the infinity. And there are uh, the, the only solution of that form is in the form of a sum coefficients a over r, and r is a distance that is a square root of x square plus y square plus z square plus a linear combination of a derivatives of one over r and and so forth and so forth and so forth if we are having a linear combination of the derivatives of the one over r and because we are physicists then the function one over r is basically a coulomb potential a potential of interaction of a two charged bodies attracting or repelling each other, or a Newton potential for a gravitational attracting body, if you like. So this linear combination of a derivative can be combined into a scalar product of a certain vector, which I denoted as a capital A, times a gradients derivatives of one over R. So that's the form of the of the of the potential, and uh, I refreshed your memory by writing this derivative of the one over r. One over r is a square root of the square of the vector. So the derivative is the is given in the following form. So if we just take the that term, then the derivative of a velocity is a over r over r cube, and that means that this is the uh, the vector n, and the vector n is a unit vector pointing the direction of a radius. So this is a vector r divided by its length. So that is why the formula a times r over r cube is equal to a times the vector n over r squared. It turns out that this notation is of a great convenience. All right, let's uh, look now at the integral of the particle current over the sphere S. The sphere, fictitious, mathematically constructed sphere around the object and the density is constant so uh, it is just for the sake of arguing that flux uh, is easily calculated now and it is equal to a four pi times a this is a gauss law which you should or might remember from the from the studying of electrostatics and um, well, if I have a body which is moving in a liquid, then uh, the flux of a particle over that large volume must be equal to zero because the conservation equation uh, says that it cannot be a uh, flow over that sphere because if there was a different from zero, flow of a matter over this fictitious sphere yellow s that would imply that there is a source of matter inside of that volume and there is no source of the matter there is just the red body which is pushing the liquid in whatever direction but there is no source of matter therefore this integral on the physical grounds must be equal to zero Therefore, the coefficient a must be equal to zero. 
Therefore, if I have this situation as described by this drawing, then out of that solution, general solution of the Laplace equation, this firm term drops out. So for our application, what is of importance is this second term that is a linear combination of the derivatives of one over R. Since the derivatives of one over R is just of that form, then we easily can write down the solution uh, for our problem. We have the drawing which, which is sort of helpful to remember what is what. This is a velocity. This is a radius of a, of a body. Let's think for a while about it as this is being a sphere. This is its surface. This is a normal vector directed with, parallel to the R. So the solution of the Laplace equation must also satisfy the boundary condition that is a scalar product of a fluid velocity times a normal vector must be equal to the velocity of a sphere normal component to the, to the surface. This is the boundary condition for ideal fluid, which we discussed last week. So away from the sphere, velocity is zero. Therefore, the solution of a vector potential is of that form. And out of this condition, that the velocity times n, and n is r divided by r cubed, uh, and this is the scalar product of the velocity u times n, it turns out that this coefficient a, length of that vector a, is equal to u, a value of a velocity, times r cubed divided by two. So we have solved the problem of a Laplace equation for a sphere which is moving with the velocity u within the incompressible, irrotational, that is potential liquid. And that formula, I suggest you recall. So the velocity potential now is written in a very simple form. And it is uh, a coefficient, which is ratio of the distance, the radius of a, of a sphere divided by the distance from the sphere times a scalar product of the velocity of a liquid boil times a normal direction. All right, so let's see what is happening further. And uh, this is the same picture. We have a solution for a velocity potential. So now I can calculate the velocity. And that is a simple-minded calculation, which I really encourage you to repeat by yourself. You have to calculate the scalar gradient. And why do you have two terms? Because you have to calculate the derivative of that coefficient, which is one over r squared. And then there will be additional term, which is the derivative of the, the scalar product. And if you do this correctly, that will be the final result. The velocity of the liquid is decaying as an r over a square from the sphere. And it has this peculiar form. It, is, it has a term which is proportion to the velocity minus this cof other term. And the important point is that this other point, term contains a scalar product of a velocity times n. And out of that picture, you easily see that this scalar product depend on the angle, depend on the cosine of the function of the angle between these two vectors. So that term, has this angular dependence. 
So if I plot it in on a plane, that these are the constants of the velocity around the body which is moving in whatever direction. Well, because the uh, 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 out of the Galilean principle, if the body moves with the velocity forward, that is the same as it is stand still, but the fluid moves around it, then it is somewhat easier to plot it this way. So that is the velocity field, which has this, the occasion it's called the dipolar flow, but that's just an important name. So that is the velocity field around the sphere. All right. So now we have to do the further calculation, namely, we would like to calculate a pressure distribution over that sphere. What is the pressure distribution on the surface of the body which moves through the liquid? And in order to solve this problem, we use the, uh, the this form of the, of the uh, Euler equation. And because the density of a liquid is constant, then the function W reduces to the ratio of a pressure over a density. And again, remember that the density is constant. And that is the arbitrary function of time because the Euler equation is a derivative of it. So if we calculate derivative, that, that strong, strong, this term drops out. Okay, so we have our situation and we have the velocity of a fluid. And uh, uh, I will now ask you to follow my exercise in doing the integrals. I shall now calculate a kinetic energy of the fluid. I have a body moving in a liquid, and the system has a certain fluid has a certain kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy of a liquid is a density, which is constant, so I take it in the front of the integral. And there is a integral of a square of the velocity of a fluid over the whole volume of a liquid over the volume. But what is, the, uh, what is that? So now I will do the trick. I will write the velocity as a velocity plus a velocity of a sphere and a scalar product of a velocity minus u. So using the simple algebra, you see that this, if I do this multiplication, then I will uh, immediately get that it is a v square plus u square w if we look up at the calculated so far expression for the velocity so i have to this have to do the calculation i have to subtract the term and therefore the kinetic energy of a fluid can be written as an integral of a velocity square sphere squared plus that integral of a complicatedly complicated scalar product. But the velocity is of a sphere is everywhere the same. So therefore, I can calculate very easily that integral. And this is the U square times a volume of a liquid minus a volume with the subscript zero which is a volume occupied by a body. Well, that sphere occupies a certain volume of a liquid, and that volume is V0. It is actually a 4 pi divided by 3 times a cube of a radius of a sphere. But that's a nice formula. So therefore, and furthermore, I can write the sum of the velocity plus U as a derivative 
of a vector potential and u can be written as a u times r. So I can write that sum of vectors as the derivative of a following expression. So if I do this, then my integral of a velocity square becomes the following. And I use this gradient to write this scalar product as a divergence of that expression. You easily can find out by doing the calculation that I'm right because the divergence of it is a gradient of this term, which is V plus U times V minus U plus that term and the divergence of V minus U. And that divergence of V is automatically equal to zero by a Laplace equation. And the divergence of U is also zero. So therefore, that is the reason why I was able to write the scalar product is a divergence of this complicatedly looking expression. Okay, and because this is a divergence, then now I can use the, I can do the integration by parts or use the Ostrogratsky Gauss Stokes theorem of the vector integration. And this integral is nothing else as the integral over a surface of a volume V. And the surface of a volume V consists of two parts, which are shown on my drawing. Namely, this is this mathematically constructed sphere far, far away from the body. That is the one surface. And the other surface is the surface of a body, which I denoted by S sub zero. So the integration by part or, or the surface and change of the volume integral into a surface integral of this term of our expression gives me a surface integral of the following form. So let's see what will happen with this integral. Uh, I re remember you this product and uh, this is the Bernoulli equation. So setting f of t equal to zero uh, or, or, or fixing up it as a, as a pressure at infinity, I can rewrite this equation as a pressure is equal pressure at infinity minus rho v square over two minus derivative of phi. Okay. And the time derivative of a potential is just the derivative of a fluid velocity potential with respect to the vector u times u dot minus u times gradient of the phi. So I substitute that here and the pressure distribution over the sphere turns out to be given by that particular formula. So we see that the pressure distribution on the surface of a moving sphere is proportional to the derivative of u with respect to the time. And that means that if the body is moving with a constant velocity, that terms drop out and the pressure is the same everywhere. And if we now return to our calculation, then we have to do this integral and we have to do this integral over the surface. And the vector, infinitesimal vector on the surface is in the direction of a normal vector times the area R square times the element of the angle angles which is in a three dimension, uh, a function of a two angles. And in order not to confuse the velocity potential with the polar angle, spherical angle, I just in for that, for the, for that 
in these calculations, I have denoted the other polar uh, spherical angle by a letter alpha, because otherwise I will have two letter phi's in the same equation, which will lead to the confusion. So now we have this expression. This is the volume of the large sphere. It has the R number R. And uh, now we have to do this calculation. And in order to do this calculation, we have to do a little bit of a geometry. Consider the following integral over a surface of a sphere. So the de om delta d omega is the integration over the angular de dependence on a sphere. And I integrate a scalar of a vector a with the normal vector to the surface and the ve scalar ve product of a vector b to the surface. Well, that if the vectors a and b are constant, then I can take them out of the integration and I have the complicated looking integral of a ni and j over the surface of a large sphere. But the integration over the normal vector to the sphere over the surface of a sphere is very simple. It's the, spheric, it's the spherical angle for pi times a average value of the product of the vectors n, i, n, a, and j. So I then have to calculate the, what is the mean value of the integral of a scalar of the vector n, i, n, j. Because, the surf, because we are having a system with a spherical symmetry, then there is no special direction chosen. There is no special direction. Therefore, the result of that integration cannot depend on any specific direction. Therefore, the integral must be proportional, must be proportional to the Kronecker delta, the symbol delta ij, which is zero if the indices i and j are different and is one when the indices are the same. Well, that means that this average value is the average value of nx square plus ny square plus nz square. But each of them is basically one. Therefore, the value of this average is just one third over times the delta function because each of the components is the same. So one plus one plus one is three. So the average value must be simply the one third of that. So if I substitute to that integral the result, then I obtain that if I have two constant vectors, A and B, and I have to calculate on the surface the following integral, then the results has been done without going into the spherical coordinates just by using a simple geometry. And this is a four pi over three of a scalar product of a vector A times vector B. Okay, so we can now put into this expression, a expression for a velocity and vector potential. And then the integral has, the following form. And the reason why I ex did this exercise in the geometry is that this surface integral is exactly of that form. Here we have a scalar product of a ve constant vector a times constant vector u with the scalar vector. And here we have a simply product of two scalar vectors of the same form. So I apply to each of the terms of this integral that expression. Let's, let's look first here. Well, we have a times n and u times n. 
So in this notation, A is A and B is U. So this first term is a four pi divided by three. So that three drops out. So this is a four pi A times vector N, uh, times vector U. And that term is a UN times UN. So this is U square times, this is a U square, four pi over three times A is U and B is U, so it's U squared. So that terms here is four pi over three times R cube times U squared. So that is exactly the first term on the left hand side here. So these two integrals over the large fictitious mathematically constructed sphere around our moving body, they cancel out. What is remained is the u square minus times a volume of the sphere and that integral here, which is a times u. So the final result of our integral is the following. Uh, now I multiply again by the density. So the kinetic energy of a fluid calculated with the body moving with the velocity inside is equal the density and the scalar product of the vector A times uh, velocity of a body and minus velocity of a body's time u square. And we know for a so that is the beautiful, simple-minded expression. And the important point is that it is finite number. It is a finite number. The, we calculate that kinetic energy and it turns out to be finite. In spite of the fact that we were considering a motion of a body in infinite volume of a liquid, because the perturbation is locally, the kinetic energy which is provided to that system is of a finite term. You always have to remember that everywhere in the physics, potential energy is defined with an arbitrary constant added to it. So everything is perfectly all right here. Okay, so that is the expression for a kinetic energy. And for a sphere with the radius r, that coefficient a was, I ask you to remember it, it's the velocity times r cubed square. So if we add it here, then the, this is a simple expression. But what happens? when the body which is moving in a liquid is not spherically symmetric. It is not spherically symmetric body. It is just the, some body with a smooth surface, but well, I, 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 I happen to have a nice drawing of an ellipsoid, so I use the ellipsoid. And this ellipsoid, is moving with the, with the velocity v in a liquid. Well, we have now to solve the Laplace equation with the boundary condition, not on the surface of a sphere, which we used to calculate the value of a coefficient a, which is u times r cubed over two, but we have to solve this equation with the boundary condition on the ellipsoid. That is a calculating, that is the, that's doable for ellipsoid, and it's also doable for certain other uh, uh, objects or with the different shapes. But because the boundary condition is linear and the Laplace equation is also linear uh, differential equation, then the, for arbitrary shape, uh, which is not too wide, it, doesn't have a edges or something, it's a smooth surface, then 
for the smooth surface, the of another shape, this vector a is a linear function of a velocity u. And that is a very general construction. And the mathematical part of applied mathematics, which is busy with calculating, solving this equation for other shapes than sphere or ellipsoid, is, uh, uh, is occasionally, with this connotation to hydrodynamics, called associated mass theory. And the statement that for other shapes, the vector A is a linear function of U means that the components of the, of the vector A are linear combination of a comp components of a vector U. So I can write it as the AI times a certain coefficients delta Mij times Uj, and these are the, this, this matrix delta M is a second order tensor, and it is the addition term which this which we can calculate. If we inject this expression into the expression for a kinetic energy, then we can write the kinetic energy as a quadratic form of a velocity of a body component. Well, because this is the delta m i j a i u j, and this is also delta function of a u i u j. So we have a certain expression for the of the following form, and um, this expression is an effective mass of the body. It looks like the same expression in the mechanics. Kinetic energy is now proportional to the quadratic form of a velocity of that body component, but the coefficient is a, depends on the angles. The Mij is a matrix, so it's different dependence for different components of the velocity, and you have to add them together. And remember that if I write the formula with these indices, then this is just the sum over, the, over all the indices i and j. So that is a beautiful expression. The kinetic energy for a body with the arbitrary but reasonable shape moving in an incompressible irrotation fluid is given by that simple formula. So what happens now when we want to change this kinetic energy? Well, first we have to calculate what is a momentum. The momentum is the derivative of the kinetic energy with respect to velocity. So, well, because this matrix is symmetric, the expression is a pi, the i component of a momentum, is the mij times uj. For a sphere, for in our calculation for a sphere, that was that expression. So the change of the, of the kinetic energy, infinitesimal change of the kinetic energy, is the derivative with respect to the small changes of u. So that if I calculate the derivative of this product, then it is simply the velocity u times the derivative of that momentum. So the change of a kinetic energy is the velocity of the body times the change of its momentum. Okay, so let's calculate this as a time derivative of time. Then it is proportional to the derivative of time of vector p, dp over dt. And the derivative of a momentum with respect to the time 
is just a force acting on a fluid, as we know from the Newton laws. So because that change of time, the, the time derivative of the momentum is a force acting on fluid, then it is sufficient to change its sign from a third law of Newton to say that it is minus a force acting on the body. And therefore, this minus derivative of that delta P over dt, the force acting body is called a resistance force. We have a body moving in a fluid and the F is a force exercise on a body from the side of a fluid. So it is obvious that we call it resistance because we, we, it is a force acting against the motion of our body. So let's see what comes out of this. This is uh, the resistance force. And it is, I have a one other vector u. So I can now look at this force F, resistance force, on its component, which is parallel to the velocity field, a velocity of the moving body, plus a part of the force, which is perpendicular to the velocity u. The part of the force F, which is along the velocity u, is called the drag force, because it's dragging the body back, and the component of the force F, which is perpendicular to the velocity u, is called lift force. And these are the forces which are acting, for example, on a plane wing when it moves in the, uh, in the fluid. But there is a problem. There is a problem in the hydrodynamics, which is pretty obvious, namely that what happens when the velocity of a body is constant. When the velocity of the body is constant, then the force which is acting on the, on the other body is equal to zero. So there is no drag force on the body which is moving in ideal fluid. So all the forces are equal to zero. There is the same pressure all over the surface of the moving body. So if that would be a lift wing of a, of a plane, then the pressure distribution over all around the, 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 the wing is identical. So there is no lift force. So that would be a, a theorem that the planes couldn't fly. And that trivial conclusion that for u equal constant, the f is equal to zero, is occasionally called the d'Alembert paradox. And this is a picture of Mr. D'Alembert, Jean D'Alembert, was a founding father of the French encyclopedia. And this intellectual event, which contributed to the French Revolution, and uh, uh, his uh, famous mathematics, he, he contributed a lot, not only to the hydrodynamics, but also the classical mechanics. If you might remember the Lambert principle in deriving the Euler-Lagrange equations from, um, from Newton equations, not from the variation principle as we have done, then this the Lambert paradox. And that D'Alembert paradox is actually not the paradox, but it is just a conclusion that there is something wrong with the assumption of ideal fluid. Namely, if velocity is, if the body is moving with the 
constant velocity, then it pushes the liquid in the front of it and it causes a flow of the liquid around it. If it pushes the liquid in the front of it, then keeping the body in motion with a constant velocity requires some external agent to apply continuously the force on that body. Otherwise, it will stop. But if there is a force which is applied continuously to the body, and the body moves a certain distance, then this force will do a work. And that work adds the kinetic energy. So uh, something must happen with this energy because the energy is conserved for constant motion. And the velocity field decays sufficiently fast at infinity, and therefore it is impossible to carry that energy which is generated in a liquid in a given region to be transformed far away from the liquid, from the moving body. And there is no dissipation mechanism built in the hydrodynamic equation so far. So something is wrong with the concept of ideal fluid, and it is clearly something which is missing here. If the body moves with a velocity which is varying in time, then it's fine. Our description provides a certain information about the drag and lift force applied to that body. Maybe there are other contributions to these forces which comes out from the dissipation mechanism in the liquid. And as we shall see, these contributions are of great importance. But if the motion has to be constant, then we see the failure of a model of the ideal fluid. And uh, this argument, which was for the D'Alembert paradox, is only true if the ideal fluid is infinite. So let's look up what, what happens when I have um, uh, a fluid which has a free surface. Imagine an ocean. It has a free surface. And somewhere in the volume of that liquid, we have a body which is moving at a certain velocity u. If that volume will be infinite, then we will have to encounter a band d'Alembert paradox. But if the, there is a free surface, then there is a channel for the decay of energy. Namely, we can excite the waves on the surface of the water. If the body moves in the liquid and there is a free surface, it may cause a ripples on the surface of the water. And the waves on the surface of the water propagate with a certain velocity. And those waves can carry the energy much faster at the infinity, and they provide a certain element of dissipation to the problem. The phenomenon is called the wave resistance. And that wave resistance is a phenomenon which is of a great importance in various applications. This is a picture which I copy from Wikipedia. And this is a physical phenomenon which is encountered on the, in the, on the mouths of a great river, which they're like a Mississippi River or a Fraser River or Amazon River. Or if there is a mouth of the huge river, then it dumps into the uh, a sea or ocean uh, enormous amount of uh, fresh water. 
And the water in the ocean is a salty water. And the salty water and the fresh water have a different density. So what happens on the mouth of the great rivers is shown here. We have a salty water on the bottom. And there is a layer of a sweet water on the top of it. And let's imagine. So what, what is important here is that there is a free surface, but also that there is an interface between the salty and sweet water. So if there is an object which is moving on the surface of the water, then up here it has a certain resistance due to the fact that it pushes the ocean water or seawater around it. And this resistance has relation to this other dissipation phenomena which we have been not discussing so far. But when it comes to that region, it encounters an addition resistance due to the wave resistance due to the waves created by a moving body in the sweet water on the interface between sweet and salty water. And this additional wave resistance provides additional drag on the body of a ship. And that is a phenomenon which, is, which has been known for hundreds of years by the sailors that when they were coming to the mouths of the great rivers, they ships powered by a sails and therefore not very powerful. They, they had to maneuver differently in order to overcome this additional wave resistance uh, uh, drag which uh, was uh, encountered. So that is the uh, 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 something which is nice and important to remember. The one person who had contributed a bit to our understanding of this phenomenon was a famous uh, Norwegian traveler, Fridtjof Nansen, who had been uh, spending a long time sitting up in his boats frozen into the Arctic Sea. And uh, uh, he contributed a lot of the science at the time. He, he, his PhD thesis uh, had been a revolutionary thesis in neurobiology and had been forgotten until uh, 19, until the mid of the 20th century that his PhD thesis would probably be sufficient to, if it was known, to give him a Nobel Prize in medicine. But he also wrote the paper on this, on this water resistance. And at the turn of a, in the 19, this was a big, uh, triumph of applied mathematics that the theory of the wave resistance of the seawater of this seawater resistance uh, was uh, explained mathematically by also in the book by Darwin, the, 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 the son of Darwin, uh, who had been a great hydrodynamic. All right, so that is the uh, uh, something. So let's continue with our motion of our body. This is the change of a momentum. And we have the immersed body. And let's now write the full equation of motion for that uh, in that situation. If the, there is an external force acting or in the fluid, which I now call the little f, then the equation of motion, the Newton equation, has the following form. This is a change of a momentum p plus a change of a velocity of a body with respect to time times the mass of the body. So this is a full Newton equation for a body immersed in the, in the liquid. But 
in the co coordinates, this is the m times u dot plus the tensor m i k times u dot u k f i. So I can combine these two terms into together, and this is the final form of the equation. So we see that we have to multiply a time derivative of a velocity of a body and time derivative of a velocity is acceleration. So I have to multiply acceleration by a tensor which has two terms. It is a mass of the body plus this associated mass Mik. And if I want to calculate the acceleration, then I have to invert that matrix. For a sphere, this is uh, for a sphere with the radius r, then this is easy to calculate everything. And the associated mass tensor is 2 pi over 3 density of the body times r cube uh, of the liquid times r cube and the delta, Kronecker delta. So because the mass of the body is the radius of the body cube times rho zero, a rho zero is a density of a material out of which the sphere was built. And then for a sphere, the force is that. And the final form of the equation of motion for a sphere is the following. And that is uh, the true solution of the problem I gave you at the beginning of the, our meetings. What would be the acceleration of a balloon which is released from the, from the harness at the surface of the earth and starts to move up? And that is a proper solution. This is acceleration. And that force is the net force that is a gravity force minus uh, Archimedes force. But as you see, the right-hand side is different because it has a contribution not only from the mass of the, of the balloon, but also from the liquid. That 4 pi divided by 3 r cubed times rho over 2 is a half of a volume of a liquid expelled by the balloon. So that is why instead of this, ridiculous 9g of acceleration. If you do it correctly using this equation, you will find the correct answer and you will see that the acceleration of the balloon is relatively small. So that is the, that is the application of our formulas and this is an equation of motion. The important point is, I will go back to this slide, is that the that the mo body moving in a liquid is not a body, the mass of the body is sort of changed. It's changed by this contribution, which depends on the shape of the body. And that, that coefficient here is called effective mass. And this is a phenomenon which is everywhere in physics. Although this is a classical physics phenomenon, but somehow this idea prevails in the full physics. If you have the electron moving in a semiconductor, it attracts the ions of a lattice of the body out of which the uh, transistor, the, the, the semiconductor is made. And that means that the electrons in a semiconductor is surrounded by a cloud of excitations of the lattice. And it has the mass which is different than the mass of the electron in a free space. And it turns out that this effective mass is even negative, And therefore, in some semiconductors, 
in the equation, we used to calculate the motion of electrons, the mass, effective mass of electron is smaller than the mass of electron in a vacuum. So the concept of effective mass, which is everywhere in a contemporary physics, is actually a deeply inbuilt into the concept of a hydrodynamics. So this was our calculation. And now uh, we have to move further. And uh, this is a, a problem 11, which uh, is for you. This is to find out a relation between the velocity of, a, of the body and the velocity of a fluid when it's moving steady. And this is the problem which I suggest you solve. All right, and I just would like to uh, uh, initiate the discussion for next week with this uh, beautiful form. The other application of what is happening with the motion of the incompressible uh, uh, in viscous potential flow of a liquid is what is called the surface gravitation wave. And that is a picture which I found in the internet of a beautiful gravitational waves. These are rows of waves propagating on the surface of the ocean. And when we look from a side on them, this is what is happening. We have this beautiful rose and the liquid surface <laughs> makes the wave. So that's the layer, that's the level of the water when there is no wave. Then this is the amplitude of the wave, and this is the wavelength of the wave. And this is what happens to the particle, liquid particles, they move around. This is a crest, and this is this is the this is the crest of the wave, and this is trough of the wave. And what we will do next week, we will solve the problem uh, how to describe this kind of motion. And we will find a fundamental relation between the frequency of those waves and the wavelength. And uh, we, you find out that in contrast to what you remember from high school that the frequency of a sound wave or electromagnetic wave is proportional, is on inversely proportional to the length of the wave. You find out that the relation between the surface waves frequency to the this surface gravitational wave frequency to the length is algebraically different and that those waves are dispersing and there is a difference between the phase and and phase and, uh, and group velocity of those waves and i would uh, kindly ask you to glimpse through your textbook or notes or refresh your memory uh, from a high school physics what is meant by the group velocity and what is meant by the phase velocity for the for the wave. Okay. So see you see you then tomorrow and enjoy the rest of the day. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. bye, -bye.